Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the keynote address. Um, and now with that, uh, with that great introduction and that insight from Dr. Howard, we're prepared for our first uh, panel discussion today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn this over largely to uh, Dr. Andy Kane from University of Florida. Uh, he joins us from the newest Ag Health and Safety Center in our, in our pantheon of uh, health and safety centers. And he's made a dramatic impact on the, the Ag Centers. Uh, he and his colleagues have really jumped in to uh, this field with, uh, with both feet and uh, hands and arms and legs and, um, and have become intimately involved with us. And we're particularly grateful because before the University of Florida joined us, uh, the University of Kentucky was the only health and safety ag center in the southeastern region, uh, and we did not cover coastal issues and fishing issues and many of the things that they cover. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Florida being a tremendous agricultural and fishing state, that was a great omission. So we're delighted to have them, and I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Dr. Kane to moderate this session. Andy? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I'm Andy Kane, director, deputy director of the Southeastern Coastal Ag Center for Health and Safety out of University of Florida. It's an honor to be here with all of you for this fourth Southeast Regional Symposium, bringing together folks from five NIOSH centers in our Southeastern region, representing academia, clinical practice, industry, and government. And we welcome all of our students who are engaged in professional development training and degrees in occupational health and safety, and who represent the next generation of our occupational health and safety professionals. I have a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started, please. In this unique webcast venue for our Southeastern Regional Research Symposium this year, we want to maximize engagement with people and content, and that's tricky online. Our amazing organizing team has arranged for portions of the symposium content to be available offline. In other words, it's available for reviewing, an uptake in your time, rather than all of us synchronously viewing, for example, posters during the webcast. So our pilot presentations, pilot project presentations, our poster presentations, and our center director updates have been pre-recorded and are all online via the symposium website. So when we go into the poster sessions this afternoon, for example, we hope that you've had the time to review the presentations and the presenter's short video hooks prior to that session. And this really allows the focus of the session to be more interactive and affords functional time for questions and answers. So please do attend the poster session, review the materials ahead of time, and engage with our presenters. Please note that we will be splitting you up into poster session breakout rooms, allowing for a really reasonable presenter audience ratio. You will not have a say in which room you land in, but please be assured that you're in the right place. We really need you there. You can't change the room that you're in, but don't feel ripped off if the room placement where you land isn't where some of the choice presentations that you wanted to see are really happening. All the presentations are online and available to review during this meeting and into the future. Right? This symposium is recorded and will be archived and available online to attendees as a valuable living resource. So speakers, this is just a note for you guys. If you're a speaker, please keep track of your speaking time. We're all on the same world clock here. At the end of your time slot, your moderator will transition to the next speaker, so please be aware of your time. So listening to Dr. Howard's opening keynote presentation and considering what the future of work studies might really look like, we realize that that life and work sectors and work life are dynamic and they change with the times. But I gotta tell you, don't necessarily wait for Dr. Howard's next missive because I wanna remind all of our attendees that we also represent leadership and capacity in the area of occupational health and safety. And our ideas and research can help to paint the picture of this future together for the future of work studies. So thank you so much for being part of this symposium and our community. We're counting on you. Leadership is where you find it. And my quote for the day for all of you is, when I find great leadership, I try to learn from it and support it. And as such, it's my pleasure to kick off our first panel session this morning, focusing, focusing on industry challenges in these times of challenge and a pandemic. 
Our panelists represent a phenomenal range of support for industries in our region and for an equally remarkable diversity of workforce. Our panelists this morning include Ryan Bradley from Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United, supporting Mississippi and Gulf commercial shrimpers, fishers, oyster and crab harvesters, and commercial aquaculturists. Aaron Nelson from Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce, supporting sustainable communities through diverse local enterprises. A lot of small businesses, but various sized businesses. And Kevin Price from the National Institute of Minority Economic Development, otherwise known as the Institute, supporting diversity and minority businesses. Doc Terry will be joining us from the University of Central Florida Rosen College of Hospitality Management, supporting hospitality sectors nationally and globally. Jeannie Economos joins us from Florida Farm Workers Association, supporting farm and ag workers. And finally, Brian Warwick from the University of South Florida's Safety First Program, a unique program supporting small, high hazard businesses throughout Florida. So with that, it's my pleasure to kick this session off and introduce our first panelist, it'd be Ryan Bradley. I'm gonna give a very quick introduction for each speaker and then uh, you'll take it away. So Ryan is the executive director for Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United. And Ryan is a fifth generation fisher who's extended his reach from the wheelhouse to the community in supporting sustainable fisheries in Mississippi and throughout the Gulf through leadership and stewardship. Ryan is a successful, is a successful fisherman, a community organizer and leader, a lobbyist and a family man. Based on his perspectives and vast experience, we look forward to learning about his stakeholders, their challenges and concerns, and where assistance can be helpful and valued. Thanks, Ryan, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to speak to you. Um, I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, attention to the commercial fishing here in Mississippi. I'm going to show you a little bit uh, about uh, our organization and what we're doing here in Mississippi and how the COVID has impacted and um, you know, talk a little bit about just what is the general feel from our constituents down here in southern Mississippi about uh, the COVID situation and uh, you know, anything that we can do to uh, be better prepared to, to fight this uh, pandemic. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our organization uh, against Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United. Uh, we serve to protect the common interest of Mississippi's commercial fishing industry, uh, promote sustainable fisheries through leadership and stewardship, and advocate on behalf of commercial fishing uh, businesses and consumers of the resources our industry provides. We are a 501c6 uh, tax exempt entity with the IRS and uh, we're a corporation, corporation in the state of Mississippi. Uh, we currently have about 279 members. Uh, our management structure consists of four, uh, five board of directors and uh, we currently have four employees. Um, this is just a little snapshot of our board of directors. I always like to acknowledge our leadership team. Uh, I'm not going to name everybody. And then uh, we have a good staff that's working uh, for us weekly there and uh, doing a great job keeping things moving along. But, uh, excuse me, I wanted to mention uh, some of our partners, give them a shout out. Uh, we do work with a uh, wide, uh, diverse community. Uh, throughout the Gulf region and, and throughout the United States, uh, frankly, but uh, this is uh, some of the groups that we work with. And whoop, we'll go back one. And then I wanted just to kind of give you guys some insight into uh, what it, what's going on down here in Mississippi in terms of our commercial fishing and seafood. So uh, shrimp is our biggest uh, industry. Uh, a lot of shrimp uh, boats, a lot of shrimp uh, landed in Mississippi. Uh, second would be our oysters. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our wild oyster reefs have took a little hit here over the last few years from numerous uh, disasters. But uh, we are doing some, as uh, Dr. Kane had mentioned, some off-bottom oyster farming, and that's a relatively new uh, industry. Uh, so oysters is a big, probably number two, and then fin fish followed by blue crab. Uh, these are generally independent operator, uh, owner operator vessels. Uh, each vessel may have one to three persons on board and they, uh, the vessel 
range is anywhere from about on average 40 to 80 feet to give you an idea of the vessel. So relatively smaller vessels uh, in the big scheme of things and uh, smaller crew size on these vessels. But I figure that may be important uh, in considering what we can do to, to help combat the COVID situation. Uh, and then I just put up a little graph there uh, in this slide that uh, shows, you know, at the peak of our uh, industry at our 2015, uh, we were about $500 million annually uh, revenue generating industry with uh, close to 10,000 jobs uh, from the seafood industry. So pretty, pretty big industry in the state of Mississippi. Um, so this is what our boats look like. This is some oyster boats uh, working out in the Mississippi Sound. And I uh, just wanted to give you guys an idea of the type of vessels that most of our membership uh, utilize. A lot of these vessels are dual use. They are converted throughout the year for both shrimp and oyster production. Um, we do have a, a lot of multi-generational, multi-ethnic uh, communities, mostly uh, Vietnamese, uh, some Hispanic. Um, and the industry is about split uh, nearly 50-50 between Hispanic and Caucasian uh, participation in the commercial fishing sector. So um, dockside infrastructure processing where, the, where all the product comes in, comes unloaded is a, is a very critical uh, juncture in our industry and we support these businesses as well. Um, just trying to give you guys an idea of what what the landscape is uh, and the different types of fisheries. This is some of our net fishing fisheries. Uh, there's some mullet here in this boat, uh, Biloxi bacon, if you've ever heard of it. Uh, this is that. And um, let's see, we have our oyster farming. We had mentioned there's a new, new round of oyster farming going on. And uh, this is off bottom culture. It's a new, uh, relatively new type of uh, farming for oysters. And so uh, that's taken off well in Mississippi. And, um, and then I wanted to give you a peek inside of some of the processing facilities. This is a uh, shrimp processing facility in Biloxi. Uh, as you can see, the, the, PPP, uh, the PPE is uh, required certainly indoors in these facilities. And I wanted to highlight these uh, processing facilities because uh, this is really the main juncture uh, the bottleneck where we have issues, uh, you know, with COVID and uh, inside these processing plants. As you can see, there's a lot of workers oftentimes in these plants uh, working in close quarters. Uh, there has been great strides to, you know, to make sure that they have, uh, you know, mask and, and whatever else, uh, sanitizer. But uh, we have seen uh, uh, a fair amount of instances where uh, workers have been testing positive more frequently inside of these processing plants. So uh, I know it's uh, certainly uh, something that, that the agriculture sector is dealing with. And, uh, you know, we're dealing with the same as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so I just wanted to stop there for a minute. I still have a few minutes uh, and talk a little bit about kind of the uh, culture down here. In Mississippi, I think we have a really uh, diverse community, and and with that, we have mixed uh, feelings on the COVID response and uh, COVID uh, protection measures, uh, with the you know the mask mandates or the the lockdowns or, or whatnot. Um, so just to kind of give you a lay of the land, it's just a really uh, diverse community, very uh, big difference in opinions between folks. Um, you know, one thing that I would say where I felt like we could have done better in supporting the seafood industry is helping to get PPE and sanitizer out uh, to these businesses in our seafood supply chain. Uh, we've seen a, a, a large push throughout the agriculture sector where uh, I think they did a lot to make sure that our, our ag processing facilities uh, had everything they needed. Uh, I just want to make sure that the seafood industry is getting uh, all their fair share of that as well. But, uh, but also down to the fisherman level, uh, we recently had a, a new uh, executive order that had come out recently from the Biden administration and uh, mandating the, the use of masks on all uh, fishing vessels. 
So uh, there is some things that they're trying to put in place to, to uh, help the situation on these vessels. But I can tell you, uh, you know, from the, the industry's perspective, they're a little hesitant and in, in compliance with these uh, executive orders and these mandates. So there is some challenges there. Um, but, but overall, uh, you know, again, I would say that our biggest concern is in our processing facilities. Uh, as many of us saw during the, the height of the pandemic, uh, sometimes it was hard to get beef in the supermarkets, chicken, uh, pork was hard to come by sometimes. And so it's very important that we maintain a robust and very strong seafood supply chain uh, to make sure we keep a, a strong local food supply. And I think that uh, what we've seen last year in 2020 really brought that to light. And uh, we've learned a lot from that. And so, uh, you know, if there's anything that any of us can do to support our seafood industry, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, making sure that our seafood workers have all the necessary protections that they need. And uh, so with, with that, um, I did one last slide. I wanted just to uh, mention our website here. You can go to www.mscfu.org. You can find us on Facebook at MSCF United we're on Twitter at MSCF United. And uh, again, we're Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United. We're a nonprofit alliance formed by fishermen uh, for fishermen. Uh, we are inclusive of, uh, you know, multi-ethnic uh, uh, businesses and uh, different uh, fishermen throughout the supply chain uh, of the seafood industry and different businesses throughout that supply chain. So. Uh, uh, you know, part of what we do, again, we're promoting sustainable seafood, we're defending your seafood access, and we're advocating for our commercial fishermen uh, at both the state and the federal level. And so uh, we do spend a lot of time in our state houses and in Washington, um, trying to make sure that we can have sustainable seafood uh, available for generations to come. And so I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Kane and uh, I'll stick around if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ryan. Um, that was some really great broad brushstrokes to give us a feel for who you're working for um, and some specifics to understand some of the specific challenges, both um, out on the water harvesting and in processing plants and the perception of the product, which affects the entire industry. So our next speaker is Aaron Nelson. He's president and CEO of the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce. So chambers of commerce provide essential support for local businesses for growth, and in some cases, community revitalization and prosperity. So folks like Aaron support businesses by lobbying, writing grants, and connecting and promoting businesses and functionally partnering with businesses and people. As such, this puts Aaron Nelson in the perfect position to understand small business needs and visions moving forward. And with that, Aaron, I'll let you take it away. Sure, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and the introduction and let's get to it. I'm gonna give it to you Southern accent, Northern speed. Just stuff all this in 10 uh, minutes, but I'm grateful to be uh, with you all today. As I describe some of the challenges facing small businesses, I'm gonna maybe be a little strident in some of it to create contrast <laughs> with some of the challenges. So our organization represents 700 businesses. We've got a board of directors of 35 a community leaders, staff of 10. Most of our businesses are small, 80% less than 50 employees, 90%, um, or probably 90% less than 50 employees, 80% less than 10 employees. Um, and in this pandemic, what they have relied on us for is technical assistance, advice, connection to information, when there was just a swirling bit of, you know, where should they go? Um, how should they find information in order to make good choices? I encourage you all to partner with your local chamber of commerce to be a conduit of information out to small and mid-sized uh, enterprises. Uh, our board chair likes to say that we are all in the same storm, but in very different boats, or now I know I should say vessels. We are all in the same storm, but in very different uh, vessels. Everybody in the small business community is experiencing this very differently. 25% of small businesses in our network are doing better than they ever have. They're doing better than they ever have. This has been very good for their business. We have 25% uh, who are barely hanging on on the cusp of closure or have closed in our community. We have 40 permanent closed uh, enterprises. 
And then we got 50% in the middle that have never worked harder in their whole life. And they're not making any money doing it, but they are barely, uh, but they are uh, hanging on. Uh, as you guys can imagine, our retail and our restaurant community have, and hoteliers have had this the worst, but you may not think about uh, the negative impact on medical. We know medical has been very busy if you're a hospital or a healthcare, but y'all pediatricians, business is way down because when my kids are not working with other kids, there's no pink eye, there's no uh, lice being spread, there's no flu, there's no colds. So all the things that used to drive a pediatrician's office are really on the uh, decline. Our professional services uh, in general have done well. If you've got letters after your name, CPA, JD, and you charge by the hour, uh, this has been all right, uh, has been our experience. Hardware, grocery, of course, have done very well. Hardest hit again, retail, uh, restaurant, uh, performance venues, et cetera. When we take a look at the data, we see transaction volume. Um, we have access to the credit card processing data of many of our members. It was cut in half as COVID came about, but has started to rebound. Surprisingly, retail sales in many communities remained steady, if not better than before, as people, instead of shopping locally, bought it from Amazon and had it delivered to their house. Uh, but in many communities, retail sales have been holding I encourage you, if you're curious about what's going on in your local economy, find some unusual indicators. For us, bus ridership is one of them. Bus ridership in our community was down 90%, but we're now starting to see it pick back up so we can tell if our employees, particularly at major employers like universities and hospitals, we can tell that it's starting to go back to work when we see whether or not people are riding the bus. There's three things that small businesses really needed in this crisis. That was the three C's. They needed capital, they needed customers, and they needed clear communication. On the capital side, uh, the Payroll Protection Act, idle loans were great. The delay in PPP2 has been really tough. And particularly black and brown businesses, black and brown owned businesses or managed businesses have, have had um, to limited access. We have seen in our community, as you've heard across the country, uh, that some folks didn't have traditional access to their banks, did not already have a lending relationship. And if you didn't already have a lending relationship, finding money uh, in this crisis was hard. Non-traditional businesses really struggled to gain access. Maybe they weren't really incorporated. Maybe they were uh, a side hustle enterprise or um, a sole proprietorship. Uh, we also learned a lot about who works for whom. I always knew that at a hair salon, the people cutting hair might be independent contractors. I did not realize that at a dentist office, most of the hygienists are independent contractors and don't really work for the dentist. And so how do we supplement their income and support their uh, businesses? So that was capital. Folks needed capital. They needed customers. And I think our challenge is, is we scared the hell out of everybody on purpose to get them to comply with washing their hands, not touching their face, keeping distance, right? At the beginning of this, we were all washing our groceries. And so we really had to tell people this thing was dangerous in order to get the customers to comply. But now we've scared the hell out of them. And getting them to return is difficult. Unscaring them, I think, is going to be a real challenge. If you write out the word scaring, it looks a whole lot like the word scarring. And I think that there will be some scarring left over after this. It's a little like we watch the movie Jaws every single day for 10 months. And now someone's going to say, hey, it's okay to get back in the water uh, once vaccines come along. We think it's going to take a long time for the customers to return. Clear communication has been really rough. And if you guys can play a role in helping give good information to trusted sources. But small businesses have just not known really what to do. We know the three W's, right? We're supposed to wash our hands, we're supposed to wait, and we're supposed to wear a mask. Uh, but everything from tax credits and taxation the health department, of course, is telling restaurants and others what to do that they regulate, but a CPA firm trying to figure out how to tell its employees that they are or are not safe coming back to work, whether they should or should not engage with the customer, um, there's really not reliable uh, information. I'm going to try to wrap this in the next two minutes, maybe uh, three. On the worker side, which is, I think, y'all's focus. It's a lot similar to the Jaws example I just gave. We, uh, workers, were the consumers of information about whether or not it was safe to go back to the workplace. And we showed them the movie Jaws for a while. And now when we talk to them about returning to work, it's a real struggle. They are uncertain uh, what makes them safe. Teachers, for example. 
um, are really struggling with this question. Uh, in North Carolina, we just saw an ABC report by a consortium. They looked at 90,000 students in 11 school districts with not a single transmission between student and teacher, not a single transmission, not a single transmission between student and teacher, yet our teachers are scared as hell about going back to the classroom. We're really struggling on how to tell people accurate data and whether or not they can uh, trust and believe it. Um, and that has been the uphill battle, both for customers and employees. How do we share, how do you use your chamber of commerce or other a professional association like the, the fishery organization? How do we use them as a pipeline for good information sharing? How do we help our, um, uh, how do we train them? Because there's almost nothing going to the small business owner on what to do to keep their place of work uh, safe, though we have required them to be the enforcer of the law. I think, unfortunately, like smoking in public places, it's not the smoker who gets in trouble, it's the restaurateur who allowed the smoking. So the person not wearing their mask is not in trouble, it is the restaurant for not making them wear the mask. And that's put an incredible amount of responsibility on a retail clerk, on a restaurant server, and finding different and better ways to enforce community standards, I think will be super, um, super important. Um, final piece on vaccination, we're super frustrated by who goes in what order. For example, in North Carolina, if you are a restaurant worker, um, you are now next. But if you work in a retail store, and that feels like a very similar experience, you're not next, you're not until the very end. So our retail workers, uh, are still at the very end, though they have a lot of customer interaction or an HVAC repair guy who's got to come into your house. He's at the very end, uh, but hotel workers and restaurants are at the front. So we're hoping for some improved ordering of who gets what and when. And with that, I think that's 10 minutes. I said Southern accent, Northern speed, and I look forward to the panel discussion afterwards. Fantastic. Thank you so very much, Aaron. Um, maybe maybe this is the time where we recognize that leadership exists in the, the restaurant owners also. They're not the bad guys telling people they need to mask up or they have to mask up. They're the people that are sort of providing an opportunity for understanding how we all come together and enjoy um, the great digs and eats in that restaurant to be able to provide that leadership. So our next speaker is Kevin Price, and um, going from small businesses to sort of any size businesses, but focusing on people that are really trying to make things work. Um, Kevin is hails from the National Institute of Minority Economic Development, otherwise known in the world as the Institute. And um, Kevin supports diversity and minority businesses. Kevin's leadership and grassroots partnering brings the constructs of diversity and inclusion to the spectra of businesses, large and small, and he's based out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So inclusion means more than just persons of color potentially, but opportunity for workers to contribute and prosper regardless of race, gender, and other biases that can get in the way of a productive and economically viable workforce. So let's hear from Kevin, whose focus is on providing in inclusive um, and productive and prosperous workforces. Well, thank you, Dr. Kane. I appreciate the invitation and I uh, look forward to sharing some information with you all. Um, I believe my slides are gonna come up, uh, but if not, I can talk through them. I have the uh, privilege of following Aaron, who set a high bar with nine minutes instead of 10. So I'm really challenged now to figure out how to live up to that, that standard. Uh, the uh, National Institute of Minority Economic Development who we are is really an advocacy organization at our core. Uh, we provide technical assistance and advocacy for organizations uh, throughout the Southeast. And you can see there our footprint, uh, but that's what we have been at our core since 1986 is providing that advocacy for organizations. And we are very excited this year because we're celebrating 35 years of being in existence uh, and expanding a lot. So the two states that you don't see there from an expansion perspective are Tennessee and South Carolina. Uh, but the banks are asking me to come in, so we will do that and provide support. We're also excited because last year we merged with a community development financial institution 
So where in the past we've been providing technical assistance and advocacy work, uh, now we have the ability to provide financial resources to uh, the businesses that we support as well, which in the case of last year was 2,400 minority women uh, owned businesses that we supported through some form of technical assistance, everything from business concept to I need to scale my business or connect me with corporations that need my services or my products. We do all of that and everything in between. Uh, so very excited about the work we're doing. And so who do we support? Not only the minority businesses and women-owned businesses, but our stakeholders include corporations, banks, uh, government entities, uh, foundations, intermediaries, and other stakeholders that are engaged in this work uh, and help us make this successful. Now, you all have uh, seen the headlines, I'm sure, which really explain why we exist as an organization. Last year, I think the uh, Washington Post and Bloomberg did a really good job of explaining how we probably lost somewhere in the order of 40 to 41 percent of just African-American owned businesses nationwide. And in conversations with the Secretary of uh, Administration for North Carolina, she asked me, well, do you think we're on parity with that in North Carolina? And I would say probably so. Uh, but there was an additional 37, 38% of Latinx businesses that we also lost during that same time period. Uh, so lots happening in this space. Now, what does this really mean? That when uh, majority businesses catch the cold, we minority businesses tend to get the flu. So that's how this works, meaning we've gone into a uh, downturn in the economy and now a pandemic with lacking resources uh, and lacking the, the access, going back to what Aaron mentioned earlier, uh, not having those banking relationships made a difference uh, and worked against many of these diverse businesses. Interestingly, to Aaron's point, what many states saw, even though we saw this tremendous loss of businesses, many states experienced a tremendous amount of increase of businesses filing to become new businesses within their state particularly minority and women-owned companies. Why? Because they're being laid off from the corporations. So they're starting their own business. I think the other thing that's contributing to that is young people who have seen their parents work for 20 years for a business and get laid off right before their pension uh, and things like that. So that weighed heavily on younger people. So that's a challenge as well. Combine that now with a pandemic. So it was bad enough that you had this economic crisis, but now we have a pandemic that we're dealing with at the same time. Companies are not able to offer the health insurance, so many uh, individuals are losing their health insurance, and we're identifying or discovering that there's a racial divide at the same time. Now, many hospitals kind of suspected that there were challenges, and I worked for 14 years before uh, joining the Institute for a healthcare system. Uh, so we were already starting to identify that there may be some challenges to access to health care, to affordability, um, and not necessarily getting equal treatment. So we were starting to dive into that. The pandemic exposed a lot of that for the world to see. And so we've got to address that and deal with that. In addition to that, so what does that mean? When I was on the hospital side from a business perspective, uh, it all goes back to economics for me. And what I would generally argue was it doesn't really matter how affordable you make health care or your products. If people don't have jobs, they can't afford it. So what that means is they now have, they lack the ability to be proactive with their care. They are generally going to be relegated to purchasing uh, foods at a local curb market, which generally tend to be more processed and older products and more expensive. You all know it's more expensive to eat healthy than not so healthy, which is why you can go to a fast food restaurant and get a $5 supersized meal versus you'd be challenged to find that otherwise. And so what did we do last year? We dived into some of the numbers and did a survey with about a thousand 
diverse businesses across North Carolina, minority women, veteran, LGBT, uh, disabled, to understand just what was happening from a fact base. We found that most send to, tended to be sole proprietors. Uh, they 94% of them were fewer than 10 employees. So these are very, very small businesses. Over 50% of them have been in business for over five years. So they have tenure. They have a track record. 80% uh, of them had experienced some loss of revenue. So we know this is impacting them, but they were able to still stay in business for, for most of them and keep their employees uh, by retooling how they do things, putting off uh, expenses that could wait, and all of those things just to try and keep their business in place. But they were lacking resources. So think back to last year. You saw in April, um, the government passed uh, a huge stimulus bill that provided resources for these businesses. But in North Carolina, what we found was that only 30% of them received SBA financing. Only 30%. Nationally, it was more like 25%. Now, how do we know that from a diverse business perspective? It's challenging because banks weren't collecting ethnic information, which is a challenge for us. So how do you get at this information? We looked at census tract, zip code, and those areas that were considered low to moderate income areas and, and saw that that's where the loans were being placed, which is how we got at the 25% and 30%. But even with us in our study, the 30%, you can see there was pretty balanced in terms of uh, half getting EIDL, half getting PPP money. Uh, but back to Aaron's point, for many of them, they didn't have banking relationships to start with. So you go into a banker, and I was talking with state legislators about this who were upset at, how could bankers do this? Well, I've, I've been a banker, and if you think about it, just logically, you have a client who has a credit card with you, has a car loan with you, they have a uh, business line of credit with you, and you have this uh, onslaught of money that you've got to delve out to customers. Who are you going to serve first? The one that you have this kind of, uh, exposure with or someone that's unknown that you don't have any exposure with. So bankers tended to support those that they had a relationship with first, and then they served uh, newer customers after that. The problem was there wasn't much money left after they finished with those that they had a relationship with. So that was the challenge. Now for us, you can see there, we served a lot of, uh, the survey showed us that the industries represented were all over the place. But the common theme that we saw was that many of them were in industries that had a low cost of entry. So these weren't, even though some manufacturers were on the list, most of them were not because of the expense of becoming a manufacturing. You have a plant and equipment and so on and so on. These were more of those lower cost of entry industries. Now, why am I telling you all of this and this data? I think it's very important. You all are going to go into various careers where you're going to have an opportunity to impact policy. And I believe in my gut that lots of the policies that created challenges with PPP or with other things that impact minority and women-owned businesses are not intentional policies to hurt people. It is lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of how it's going to adversely impact diverse populations. So my suggestion to you is that as you become professionals in your field, that you think about this with a DNI lens. Who am I adversely impacting by this decision? You got to be thinking about that because someone may get hurt unintentionally by your decision. The other thing is along the same lines of making decisions around purchasing. Be fair and open to all types of industries because businesses can't support uh, the community if they don't have work. They can't hire people. And if people don't have a job, they can't buy products. So this is uh, cyclical for us. We're paying each other as we go. Uh, so very important there. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out is all of this is intentional systems that we create. Uh, and so we had to dive into what other discoveries that we noticed with this. Uh, most 
of the early assistance was loan driven. And what we kept hearing from a lot of the businesses was there's enough loan money on the street. Where is the free money? Now you can say, well, PPP was supposed to be free. Well, it's forgiven, which means I got to apply for it to be forgiven. And so that creates a lot of distrust within the community. Is it really forgiven? Or are they going to come back with another way of taxing me or getting the money um, in a roundabout sort of way? So that's why a lot of minority and women businesses didn't apply because they weren't sure what the strings were going to be that were attached to the money. 43% hadn't applied for anything because of this trust again. And then uh, we saw a significant number of people who, even though they may have applied, they still didn't get anything. So this spreads like wildfire. You go out and apply for something, you don't get anything. Um, and that just spreads through the community. 58% didn't apply for any loans. Uh, so they're trying to struggle to make this happen uh, and keep their business afloat without seeking the resources that were readily available to them. And, and many of them shifted their business models and reinvented themselves. So going back to Aaron's point, uh, what we saw was that it, it was almost counterintuitive that many businesses did very well during the pandemic, uh, which was kind of surprising to some people. Uh, but they retooled their business a bit. And then there's this resurgence of, well, who are we missing in the economy and being more intentional about engaging not only people of color, but women-owned businesses in the process as well. And so how do we solve for this as the Institute? We have various tools at our disposal to work on this. And uh, all of those products, uh, all of those uh, programs that you see there are our answer to that. And I'm gonna stop there. So Aaron, I didn't do as well as you, but I apologize for that. Yeah, you did great. We really appreciate that so much, Kevin. Those insights are really helpful and I think really fruitful for us to consider um, how we deal with biases. Um, we deal with biases um, politically, we deal with biases in this pandemic, and, and to really consider the reality of day-to-day of -day biases that we have in, in um, wanting to start up a business and um, maintain a workforce. And most importantly, how we stay safe. There's bias in in workplaces and how we stay safe. So I appreciate all of those insights um, moving forward. That's certainly very, very important fodder for us. Our next speaker um, really takes us from small business to any size business. Doc Terry from the University of Central Florida Rosen College of Hospitality Management and his own private firm has been supporting the hospitality industry and its many sectors for many years. Locally, regionally, nationally, globally, um, hospitality sectors span many, many different types of markets from hotels and fine dining to transportation and fast food. You've already heard about some of that. Doc has seen it all, but mostly Doc is a people person. He sees the industry from the people perspective, both the workers and the clients with a focus on communications. I'm really interested to learn about shifts in communications and communication capacity in recent times, times of this pandemic and in the hospitality sector. So doc, tell us more. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Yes, uh, I come to you from the uh, University of Central Florida, uh, the second largest university in America, by the way. And we have the largest hospitality college in the world, 3,500 students, undergraduate, master's degree, and uh, PhD uh, students. And uh, today I come to you uh, with hospitality news. It's about the same as weather around the country here. It's kind of cold and dark, I'm, 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 unfortunately. Uh, we're a big industry. Hospitality and tourism is 10% of GDP worldwide. And it's spiraled down to 50% uh, unemployment here in the last year. Uh, can't get much worse than that. Uh, the uh, United Nations W uh, World Trade Organization says that in uh, 2020, the uh, final figures were uh, international tours were down 30%. Uh, the World Trade and Tourism Council uh, tells us that uh, in April, they thought we would be down 50 million job losses in our industry. That was in April. And the reality of it is we lost over 60 million in Asia, 13 million in Europe, 
eight million in the United States, eight million in Africa, and ended up a hundred million job losses. So that's a little cue and clue as to what we've been up against there. And unless you're in one of those 10 pandemic-free islands out in Bora Bora and Tahiti or in Turkmenistan, it's affected everybody here in our world. But let's take it down here into, uh, speaking of our world, into the United States here, where in Q2, every single state and Washington, D.C. had higher unemployment than at any time in the Great Recession. Uh, we have. Uh, Bring up here. There we, there we go. Okay, so you can see from here that I, I spent 20 years in hotels and restaurants and 20 years in teaching. And uh, when I was in hotels, managing and, and regional director and so forth and so on. So half of me is I speak to you from an academics and half of me I speak to you from practical, but 100% of me I speak from uh, hospitality. And you can see it's been devastating for us. And, and that's also in airlines, vacation and ownership, uh, ski resorts. One third of all job losses in the United States were in hospitality and leisure this past year. These are in small businesses, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, but it's also been in, in some of the huge organizations in the Palmer House in Chicago, uh, in the Wardham in Washington, D.C., the Hollywood Standard Hotel. All icons uh, in the country here have clo uh, those closed. Uh, the Marriott East Side, the Hilton and Times Square closed down. The Roosevelt, as I mentioned. Uh, so the travel dependent leisure and hospitality industry has suffered to the point of 15% unemployment, double the national average, and you get the picture. Well, what does that do to those who are working there? It's really kind of what we're talking about today here. What is PEP? PEP is saying that the losses have come from physical, economical and psychological damage to these uh, employees, whether it be, whether it be uh, entrepreneurs or, or whether these are managers, supervisors, hourly employees there. And so we're gonna take a look uh, first at physical. And um, when we come to physical, we all know about masks and gloves and distance and from coworkers and from guests. And so that's pretty standard stuff, I guess. But if you're looking at it through the lens of a hospitality, non-management individual there, they're much closer than you are in manufacturing and some of the other industries you've talked about in the sense that you're, you're at the table or at the front desk or hostess stand or putting people into attraction rides or making uh, maintenance repairs in their guest rooms, uh, and close interaction in the kitchen and servers and handing utensils and table, table work. This is... This is where it can all happen and it's going through your head. Is it safe for me when I'm in the, the guest bathroom and uh, guest room, elevators, hallways, uh, serving in restaurants and banquets and spas and pools and, and so forth. So when all these things are coming so close, what are we worried about? Well, you're worried about are the agents healthy? Uh, are the coworkers healthy? Am I healthy? Uh, I'm going to work and I'm having to... Uh, do a temperature check, a COVID check-in every single day, maybe some PCR tests. I'm having to comply with uh, AA COVID confidence certificates, perhaps, or COVID-19 safety compliance certificates. Maybe it's SGS, uh, clean and safe programs, ATP tests. So these are things that are all working my mind a little bit. And uh, let me give you an example of, of this. I'm in Orlando. A good friend of mine is a general manager of a 650-room property, uh, a national chain on Disney property. They had 270 employees a year ago. They now have 70. Managers, 40% cut in pay. General manager, 20% cut in pay. Uh, very typical. Let's say we're taking a trip out to Las Vegas here, and we decide to valet our car. Well, that's not going to get it because valets are, 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 are laid off at the moment here. What about Bellman? No, nope, sorry, same thing. We don't have Bellman now because we, we're worried about close contact. Door persons? No, sorry about that. Concierge? No, we're, we're virtual concierge now. I'm sorry. So you can check in through kiosk, contactless, remote, virtual. Okay. I want to go see some entertainment. Well, I'm spaced way apart. Takes away a little bit of this whole atmosphere, right? Because part of it is the crowd and, and part of it is the, the hopefully some type of 
of an experience of reality that isn't happening out there. I'm going to the to to the gambling maybe a little bit. I've got to watch it there also. Everywhere I look, if I'm an employee or if I'm a guest, I'm got to worry about that. Spas, many of those are closed. Buffets are non-existent. And then I go back up to my room, but no, we're not cleaning your room while you're here for these four or five days, even though you're paying, you know, godly amounts of money. Maybe I'll order some room service. No, sir. No, ma'am, we don't have room service, but we have a, you can grab a bag down in the lobby and, and pay for that. And so, and then contact, uh, non-contact um, checkout. So quite an experience different than it might've been a few years ago. And so I, as an employee, I'm, I'm concerned about all those things that are happening to my job and when I'm on the job and how I need to act and how I need to be educated as to what needs to be done. So maybe I'll go to a cruise ship. Mm, not so pretty there either, as you, as you, some of you know. So as we look into the future, and particularly if you're talking about developers, architects, designers, they're also concerned about what that is going to look like. Do we have front desk? Probably not. Those are going to go away. We're going to need much more space in uh, some of our larger areas. And um, so they're constantly looking at I work with a very, very large international architect. And uh, they're constantly looking at ways for the future of how we can make separation there. Uh, and in those rooms, of course, where we're, the, the bathtub is going away, the shower curtain is going away in favor of uh, glass doors, the desk is going away, the a contact, remotes are going away, voice uh, commands are moving into place, collateral is going away, uh, artificial intelligence is put in there. So it's a it's an interesting world. From a, that's P, E, economics. What's the economical point of view? Well, whatever happens to the owner, of course, trickles down to those who are working for the owner. And in this particular case, Ownership isn't pretty in hotels or restaurants where revenues are down 70%. And you can sustain that perhaps when you're in a, uh, in a world of, um, of uh, for a month or two or three, but not when it gets to be for a year or two or possibly three. Revenue is incredibly down. Expenses are up maybe from a labor point of view, but we're going to take care of that and get them away. And then we've got still to pay for our disinfectants and our shields and our collateral and our tip credit and all of those things that are involved there. Uh, so profits are non-existent for lodging and restaurants and losses are huge, unless you're in a business where you're a fast food for drive through to go delivery outdoor, something like that. Vacation ownerships have not been hit quite so hard, but certainly restaurants have, and they're on very, very small margins. You have to remember that. They're lucky if a restaurant with a food restaurant, if they make 10%, they're doing well. And 170,000 of those have closed and many of those will not reopen. From a hotel point of view, we are certainly feeling it because um, the in, in the past, to break even, you need a 60% um, uh, occupancy, right? And in this particular case, we moved from 70% down to 42%. Uh, average daily rate is down well below break even, and it's going to be a number of years before it comes back. Um, we can see here that the uh, occupancy is going to be down 30, was there, down 37% last year. We would we'll be lucky if we can even come back to those levels in the next 12 to 18 months. And it's going to be six to eight years before we actually ever come back uh, to where we are today, right? So that's, forget recouping, just back to those levels. The final area is hospitality, psychological, and certainly the most critical, as I'm sure most of you can understand that. This is what's going through my head if I'm working there. Unemployment is nasty, right? Where am I going to work here? Or am I working someplace else? I've done some gigs, some gig jobs, and maybe I need to move on to something else because I don't know if I'm going to have a job. And what happens about the next, the African strain, the UK strain, and others that are coming here? My kids are in school, not in school, who's home with them? Are they safe? That's what's going through my head. Am I going to have a job with starts and spurts, getting paid, insurance? What about my health and my close quarters that I'm with? Um, is the place going to even be staying open? I have a distrust of news, the employer, the length of the pandemic, and uh, what's the next wave that's coming up there? Also going through my head is the fact that I have uh, uh, I, it, because there are fewer jobs, 
there's a very high competition with my coworkers and robotics. I need to ask you to up here, Doc. Sorry about, about that. that. Um, artificial intelligence. Robots are big. Uh, robots are big in Shenzhen, China. All robots. Whole hotels run by robots, uh, and we're seeing them all over our country, also. And so um, we've got competition. AI, of course, is competition also taking away jobs. So what's needed is a re-education, reskilling, reassuring those who work there, retooling for flexibility, cross uh, training, and um, we're going to lose 15 to 20 percent of our employees no matter what we do. Um, uh, next to the last slide here, six to eight years to recover, as I mentioned before, what's going to come back first? Likely vacation ownership, rental homes, cottages, where you've got a little more space, and then long time before these cruises, theme parks, events, and uh, conventions come back. So PEP -P -P damage is just absolutely just been devastating to us. Uh, communication, vision, guidance, transparency. Um, and uh, and rebuilding trust is what it's really going to take. Uh, thank you for allowing me time, Dr. Kane, and uh, I'll turn it back to you. Communications and guidance and trust, those are all qualities that add up to leadership. Thank you so very much. And we've got two speakers left, and I'm very pleased to introduce Jeannie Economos from the Florida Farm Workers Association in Apopka, Florida. Jeannie is one of those community leaders who paints a picture for me of leadership for vulnerable populations, considering the men and women who are responsible for harvesting high quality farm and fernery products for our nation's households. Each and every one of us benefit from these products, but we don't really understand the value of these products beyond perhaps the nutritional value. So Jeannie's longstanding passion for health and well-being of farm workers and close working relationships with field workers provides unique and functional insights to understand the ongoing challenges with this vital workforce and pathways to solution. Jeannie. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And you will see um, that on my slides, um, you will see faces of farm workers. For too many years, farm workers have been the invisible ones. And today, I want to make their faces um, available to all of you to see so that you can see their humanity. Uh, you, I feel like I'm only the spokesperson for them, and so my voice is to bring their voices to all of you. Um, farm workers now, after so many years with the advent of the pandemic, we're finally hearing farm workers being called the essential ones, the essential workers. But the reality is farm workers have always been essential. They have just always been invisible and ignored and exploited. So farm workers face many occupational on health and safety problems long before the pandemic ever hit. Farm workers are exposed chronically to pesticides from some of the most toxic pesticides, um, including uh, atrazine and paraquat and glyphosate. Pesticides that have long-term health effects that can affect the second and third generations of farm workers, including occurring pesticides that uh, um, have uh, endocrine disrupting uh, properties that can affect farm workers' health. In more recent years, uh, heat stress has been one of the major problems affecting farm workers with climate change. And it's getting hotter and hotter in Florida all the time. And we've had farm worker death and um, farm worker exposures to heat that have caused illness. And as one of the studies, as part of the Ag Center, we're also studying long-term effects of chronic dehydration from high heat on the kidneys of farm workers. A part of the problem with farm workers is most of them work east way, which means they don't get paid by the hour. They're paid by how much pick or produce or harvest or plant faster and to not take breaks so that they don't stop breaks to drink water and in some industries farm workers even wear diapers to work um, because they feel like they can't stop um, to go to the bathroom. So those are some of the big health safety problems affecting farm workers before the pandemic hit. 
And then under the um, under the uh, admin, previous administration, some of the anti-immigrant policies were making farm workers go more and more in shadows and be afraid to come out to get health care or to ask for help or to get assistance. And that has only um, worsened over the years. So um, when the pandemic hit uh, in uh, agricultural communities in Florida and around the country, the new uh, uh, high priority for farm workers was being safe from um, exposure to the virus. So the Farm Worker Association of Florida for 30 years has been doing trainings on pesticide protection for farm workers and how to know their rights. We've been doing trainings for the past few years on heat stress. But sadly, with the pandemic, farm workers are not even paying attention to the pesticides or the heat. They're really concerned about the COVID pandemic. And getting um, PPE and getting information out to farm workers who often come from uh, very rural areas is very difficult. In Florida, we have um, different ethnic groups of farm workers. There's a large Haitian population of farm workers that some of them are here on TPS, which is temporary protective status. Uh, some are here as documented and others are undocumented workers. We also have a large Hispanic population and that includes, the majority are Mexican, but that also includes increasingly more and more farm workers from Latin America, including Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. A lot of these farm workers now are people that come from indigenous communities where not even Spanish is their first language, where their first language um, is Quechua or Mixtec or another very uh, uh, rural, remote language um, that only um, a, a small community of people uh, in this country speak. So the Farm Worker Association has been doing a lot of work to try and help um, address the problems of COVID for farm workers. Um, I'll just give you a real quick rundown of some of the things that we've been doing. Um, that we have been um, doing a, a weekly food drives for farm workers to get food out to the community. We work with a couple of food banks to help farm workers. Uh, ironically, the people who harvest our food often go hungry themselves. And COVID has made it worse because sometimes family members will work in other industries like construction or uh, a retail. And when that is down, then the farm workers We lost your audio there, Jeannie. Jeannie, you're muted right now. Jeannie, can you unmute, please? You can finish up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have been doing um, know your rights trainings for farm workers to let them know that, um, that it, it's safe for them to go ahead and ask for assistance. Um, we've had help with food stamp applications, Medicaid applications, um, and also with the videos in uh, Creole, Spanish, and several indigenous languages um, to get the word out to farm workers. We're really grateful to the Ag Center for including a lot of this material on their website and to getting information out to growers in the state. And so we really appreciate um, the Ag Center for that assistance. We're also part of some of the research projects that are part of the Ag Center. And what's really important to us is for the research, research is great, but it does need to be translated into actual help for farm workers in our state and in our country. So um, I'll stop there and happy to take any questions afterwards. But just remember, every time you eat, please remember the hands that feed you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Absolutely. Uh, to keep us on time, our next and last speaker of this session is Brian Warwick. Um, Brian represents this unique um, program called Safety First at University of South Florida. So vision erupts from thoughtful community engagement. And based on regional business needs, Dr. Warwick directs a novel industry consultation program to support occupational health and safety 
in high hazard workplaces in Florida. His experience and background in environmental science, industrial hygiene, occupational health and safety, and organizational management provides um, a functional and unique support for these types of businesses, although the definition of high risk in business may have shifted in these times of the COVID pandemic. So we'll see about that. We look forward to an update on how current times in this pandemic affects occupational health and safety for expert consultants who provide the support in the field to the workplace. These expert consultants are people like you in the audience who provide frontline support for workers in multiple lines of work. So I'll leave that to you, Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Kane. And I certainly appreciate my fellow panelists for giving us a broad view on the effects of this pandemic on their specific industry. You know, as a practitioner, um, I have responsibility to continue my service, continue worker health and, and safety. Uh, so the gist of my topic of the conversation we're gonna have in the next 10 minutes, focus on how we in the consulting industry continue this mission of worker safety, worker health. The idea is for us to be able to adapt and remain relevant in this changing worker landscape. So, so who are we and what do we do? Uh, the USF Safety Florida Consultation Program is the Florida's official safety and health program administrator. But this, this organization is a part of every state. It's sponsored by the Department of Labor. Labor. It's probably called something else. But OSHA has two branches, the enforcement branch and also the consultation branch. We serve as a consultation branch. So um, unlike the enforcement, we don't offer or, or do any citations or penalties. The primary mission of the consultation program, again, in each state is to assist small high hazard employers, such as those in construction, landscaping, meat processing, medical, dental uh, offices, automotive, we help them maintain a safe working environment. We help them uh, abide by the OSHA standards, right? So to help these employees eliminate workplace hazard, uh, we provide these consultative services so that they could potentially avoid injury, illness, or death. These teams around the state are made up of uh, certified industrial hygienists, certified uh, safety professionals. Um, some of them are specific in, in um, construction, manufacturing, uh, agricultural operations, and even some in the uh, mining operation as well. Um, and as safety professionals, we all know the benefit of having a safe workplace as it increases uh, productivity, but also the direct cost of avoiding um, any losses in accidents, injury. Next slide. So when, what happened, um, at, you, we looked at the effects of, of the uh, pandemic and within one month of the uh, pandemic, we noticed a precipitous drop in the consultation request. Now we have uh, uh, we have an obligation to OSHA to provide a certain number of um, uh, visits to these high hazard industry on an, on an annual basis. We do sometimes in upwards of 600 visits or so. Uh, within one month, again, we saw a 50% drop in March, and then in uh, October, another 80% drop in request. Um, so when we don't have the request, we are unable to provide that service to that underserved uh, population. So widespread business closures, uh, restrictions on travel, limitations on group size, facility visitor prohibition, stay at home, shelter in place requirements, all impeded our ability to support these small high hazard operations, right? So these safety and health consultation was the last thing on the employer's mind. I mean, their, their, their concern was more, how can we keep business open with minimum um, uh, employees and minimum customers to the extent possible? So as a result, um, this limited our ability to provide this training, 
auditing, equipment inspection, testing, and other essential safety and health industrial hygiene service that we will normally provide. And we have to do something different. Next slide. So, so we had to, to look at new ways of reaching our customers. And like the telemedicine, which has taken on a, a huge um, impact in the last year, uh, and just like Disney has offered virtual rides to get you enticed to, do, to go to the park, we had to do something much different to be able to get to our clients, even though they're open uh, minimally. So the first obstacle was first to capture as many employers as possible in the pool of likely candidates. So we launched an extensive marketing campaign uh, highlighting the need for our services, especially during these times. Uh, we need to let employers know we're open for business. And in some states, uh, for example, the state of Texas, they aren't able to get out to the, to the different facilities. So they had no choice but to find a different way to reach their customers. Right? So while OSHA is considerate of current times and, uh, and current situation, there's still an expectation that we have a safe workplace and that it was being maintained. And inspections did not stop from an OSHA perspective. So once we uh, uh, overcame the first obstacle with this extension of uh, this marketing uh, effort, the second obstacle was um, once we piqued their interest, how do we continue to to uh, convince the employer of the value and the effectiveness of what we consider a virtual safety and health visit or virtual safety and health consultation, thereby relieving them of the face-to-face -face interaction. Next slide. So we 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 embark on this on this marketing campaign that involves uh, you know some new things that we haven't done in the past. One is the electronic board system. Um, where you, there is geofencing, if you come very close to that to that uh, electronic board, um, you're actually going to text message to highlight or to 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 direct you to a certain um, to 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 our website. So so we did a lot. We we even had NPR. We had magazines. We had, we attended some of these mag um, shows as well. So we did a lot to to convince employers that this is uh, indeed a way to go to continue the service of providing um, worker safety and health. Next slide. Once the, uh, we've convinced the uh, employer, the next challenge for us internally was, was how, do we, how do we develop this application or this technology, this solution that can collect all of the data from the work site, all the documents, how can we um, obtain the videos from the different website? How do we interview personnel at the job site? And how is it uh, we can um, deliver this technology with minimal learning time, right? Also, uh, one that both the clients and the um, customer, the client customer, and our consultants are able to adapt to. Um, these are mom and pop operations that, that have small output that may not have the technology that we are accustomed to. And to be honest, we've got some older folks in the consultation program that are not, are not likely to use technology as well. So we needed a tool that was simple, one that's easy to roll out, that's extremely flexible, and configurable um, to the specific industry itself, right? And, and one that uh, wouldn't require a huge learning curve. And it was right in front of us. As, as the slide says, we didn't need a technology. We, don't, we didn't need an app. We didn't need to download everything. We just needed a cell phone to perform this service. And that's what we started doing. So the process, as indicated before, this is a change of how we used to do business before we'd actually go to the site, do the opening conference and review documents. Now we've shifted the focus. And I would, I would venture to guess this shift of focus is probably something that OSHA will stay with for a long time. I'm here my 10 minute um, alarm going off. This is the last slide. 
<laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if OSHA is going to start writing this type of process within their guidance document as well. And that is, we collect all of the documents beforehand, we review the documents, we actually do a, a Zoom um, conference call. Um, a lot of us are getting accustomed to Zoom, Microsoft Teams, BlueJeans, Lifestyle, Skype, all of these technologies we are able to do, right? And, and collect that information after subsequent um, review. Last slide, promise. <laughs> uh, one more slide, last slide. So again, some of the benefits um, of, of the program, you know, with the virtual visit, um, it certainly can't take the place of an on-site visit. That, that's that's certain, uh, and we do have limitations, as someone mentioned in uh, before. Garbage in, garbage out. So we've got to be careful with the type of data we're getting into the system, and we are at the mercy of the client. We are at the mercy of the customer uh, if he doesn't share something that he wants to share. Um, the other part that is somewhat challenging uh, until we heard this morning is this worker exposure. But you know, we, we we learned this morning that maybe sensors might be the way to go. So don't be surprised if that's an avenue we take. But the benefits really outweigh the um, the the risk. Uh, we we get more clients, and uh, the efficiency and speed is is also um, overwhelming. Uh, quick example: we had a decontamination team setting up a new business in South Florida who made a request to look at the risk assessment of his employees performing these decon activities. In the usual customary consultation activity, that will take a couple of days. We were able to get that report back to the individual that same day. So certainly there is a lot of speed, a lot of efficiency built in the program. So virtual visit is here to stay. Um, I think, uh, again, we will shift the focus. Um, and in 2020, 25% of our visits were virtual. So just that's a possible solution to the current pandemic, but I, I thought it would be a nice end to what we've heard so far. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Kane and thank you for the invite and appreciate the time. Absolutely. Um, there's so much um, change. You've really represented um, your adaptive capacity to understand the changing situation and adapt your strategies to deal with that. And I think that that's what we all need to do as a species. I think we've all been adapting in ways that are unexpected, and we're adapting so fast that um, um, there's a lot of interesting questions from our audience and a couple from um, our, um, our organizers that I want to be able to share with everybody. Um, so I want to use the time for that right now. By the way, I had a misnomer on uh, Dr. Warwick's uh, program. It's the University of South Florida Safety Florida program. I, I got that incorrect the first time. I apologize. So let me, let me take a question from our audience here. Um, and stemming off of the adaptive strategies notion. So for, for anybody that wants to chime in just briefly, please. Um, where would you be going to find answers to questions related to um, stakeholder concerns to reduce the impact of, of certain hazards, in this case, like the pandemic on the workforce that you work with? Now, where is your source for reliable information that informs you? If you want to start with that, Brian, or just go down the line, anybody who wants to chime in quickly? Uh, can you repeat the question, Dr. Ken? I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're looking to understand what are the, the, the resources that you as community leaders find valuable to inform you and to share with your stakeholders in, with regard to reducing risk factors and hazards, um, including COVID-19 in the workplace. Well, from, from, from the practitioner perspective, I would say um, we looked at the OSHA guidelines, the CDC guidelines as the premier document in regards to what, what works and what doesn't work, what has been scientifically proven and what has not. So we use that as, the, as a tool um, in providing this, this uh, service to that population. Um, in regards to stakeholder involvement, I mean, you know, one of the things you're doing right now is getting that type of feedback from the different um, uh, representative uh, on the panel. Uh, one of the things that we do is we also hook up with the um, or link with the Chamber of Commerce to see what their concerns are as well, to get that type of feedback uh, into our 
process and our loop to find out exactly what our clients are looking for. And I'll also add, lastly, the uh, we've got a uh, OSHA Training Institute that uh, does a survey of the clients that's coming into training to get some feedback on exactly what they're looking for as it relates to COVID uh, response or COVID uh, risk assessment. So that's just one thing that some of the things that we do. That sounds great. And maybe Jeannie or Ryan from uh, folks that actually uh, are in contact with stakeholders on the water and in the fields on a regular basis. Um, what are the primary sources of information that, that you use for staying informed, up to date, and, and for sharing? Well, um, I'm happy to go. Um, so we also use the OSHA guidelines um, coming out of OSHA um, for, um, for the workers. But what's important to us is to also work with other grassroots organizations in Florida and around the country. Um, because what's important is translating that into a language that the community will understand. And I don't, I don't just mean a language, but a, a culturally appropriate way of conveying that information to the different ethnic communities. And that includes creating videos and using the kinds of technology that the people use and relate to, such as WhatsApp and, um, and, and, and things such as that, sometimes Facebook. Um, we've created multiple videos, about 12 to 15 videos in Spanish and indigenous languages and Creole about the COVID and um, more recently um, about the vaccines because there are a lot of myths out there in the community that are um, unfortunately running rampant. And um, one of the main um, focuses that we have is to try and dispel some of those conspiracy theories and myths that some of the people are hearing online and from friends. So um, uh, we are using the OSHA guidelines, but also translating that into um, a way that the community can um, receive that and, and understand it. Right, thank you. So there's a very important translation component to what you're talking about. And while both of you have mentioned OSHA guidelines as, as a um, sort of a state of the art for, for that content, um, I'm hearing, Jeannie, that, that your networking and your ability for, uh, to learn from other grassroots organizations and other um, folks in, in similar positions nationally um, provide insights both in terms of the content that you need to know, but also different ways to translate it that is both meaningful um, for meaningful for your communities and, and their different cultural backgrounds. Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? I see your hand up there, Aaron. One second, please. Uh, you know, I would just say that, um, you know, we don't uh, look to OSHA for a whole lot of stuff. Maybe that's something that we need to improve on. But uh, we have to monitor a lot of uh, activity going on with NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service at the federal level. And we also have to monitor each of our state wildlife and fishery commissions at the state level. You know, and then also monitoring our state houses and, and whatnot to see what's going on. Usually, uh, you know, we keep abreast of the, the, leg the state legislatures and, and Congress and uh, try to have some influence on what's going on on the front end of policy before it comes out. And uh, that usually keeps us in the loop pretty well. But, um, you know, I just wanted to, you know, a lot of what we do is sharing information with our members. You know, they're, uh, I like to say they're in the heat of the battle. They're, they're working uh, hard every day. They don't have time to keep up with all the, the ins and outs of what's going on and what's what. And so that is a big part of what we do is uh, information sharing. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of Facebook. Uh, we have a private Facebook group, a lot of members, about half of our members are in a private Facebook group. And uh, we love that because uh, we can connect with uh, many of them very quickly. Uh, we also do email blast and, and other uh, methods of communication. But the, the Facebook posting uh, has been the best uh, form of engagement uh, that we've seen and getting the word out to people. Uh, so uh, that, that's what we do and uh, that's our take. So. Yep. Thank so you. Your, your connections at the grassroots level are really important. It's interesting that um, you know there's a lot of challenges in taking information directly from OSHA. And I know for a fact that's not because you're not aware of all of the information or how to access it, um, but you're getting that from other reliable sources as well. And frankly, sometimes the way information comes out with direct translation from OSHA doesn't put you in the best standing with a lot of your stakeholders at the same time. 
So sometimes the information to inform is critical, but it's not always what's used for, for the translation piece. Aaron, sorry for keeping you waiting. I, I think if I had 500 small businesses in the room and I asked them to put your hand up if you know what OSHA does, I'd have hardly any. Two people would tell me that those are the people that make you wear lanyards when you do construction on high rise, and that's it. They've had zero interaction with OSHA. They don't know who they are or what they do unless they are a restaurant uh, or, but in general, if you're a CPA or an attorney or a retail business or a hotel, I mean, they, it, I think, and, and you said that they know where to find the information. They just don't know how to translate it. I think they don't know where to find the information. And so I think we've got to figure out how to, who is their trusted channel. How do we send it through their professional association? How do we send it through their uh, worker association? How do we send it through their uh, chamber of commerce? But you know, the question of whether or not it, I am currently safe in my office with recycled air is not answered by anybody at the moment and is, I think, causing some, some anxiety. I do think that this pandemic has caused an improved relationship between regulator and regulated. The people we used to fear, OSHA, the health department, et cetera, are now becoming a better facilitator than simply a regulator. Right? None of us would call the IRS and say, I got a couple of questions about whether I did last year right. Um, uh, right. But now I think they've done a better job of being able to engage them and feel less heavy handed and more uh, informative. Great. Thank you. That makes sense. So let me let me throw this question out really for maybe. Um, Anybody can really take it. And uh, so here's a question that's a combination of a, an audience question and some of my own thinking. Um, for you guys, how has is, how is this last year of the pandemic changed the way that, that all of us become consumers? Is this an opportunity, do you think, during what I'm going to call a time of punctuated disequilibrium, right? So things are happening now. There's a shift in our culture, the way we see things, the way we prioritize our issues. It's happened so fast for so many of us all at once. It is, it is something that happens rapidly. It's punctuated and it's shifting our normal equilibrium. So it's a, it's a bumper sticker, punctuated disequilibrium. How, what opportunities exist because of that to reinstill the concept or construct of safety as part of our workplace culture? Where, can, where might this happen? And um, does it have to have an economic cost and still, can it have an economic impact that's positive on the industry and its products and its workers and the health and well-being of its workers? Where, where might there be room for change now because of this rapid shift and disequilibrium and, frankly, a lack of comfort that I think all of us feel to some degree? How can, we, how can we take advantage of that and marshal some of what we know is sort of the right way to, you know, the right way to feed ourselves, as it were? Um, Kevin, do you want to open that one up? Well, I, I was just thinking that actually I had to write down punctuated disequilibrium. I'm going to borrow that, by the way. It's yours. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, I think this is a, a time for us to explore new ideas of how we do things. And I think far too often we've been kind of stuck in this is the way it's done. Um, and it was a very rigid, hard line there. Of this is how it's done. Even though there may have been people who thought of more creative ideas, you always kind of get stuck, stuck at the wall of this is how it's done. And what the pandemic, I think, showed us is that we can actually do things differently. Uh, we, we've noticed how we've gotten products out faster. We've gotten a vaccine out faster than history. Uh, so... Um, we can do things differently if we choose to. So I think it's just a matter of us um, thinking a little broader. And I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to thinking outside of the box. I never thought there was a box. So it's how do we think more broadly and more inclusive of other ideas that may be in the room, which in the past have been this, this uh, minor voice that didn't necessarily get a whole lot of audience because of the wall. So this is an opportunity for inclusivity. I think that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, people are more receptive to it and therefore um, you don't have to use a bigger hammer, you just have to use the right hammer. 
Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it's also a time for a lot of us have run this like uh, a buffet. We would tell our customers, we have all this information here. It's all on our website. It's all at our office. It's all at our program. It's all at our conference. You come and eat from our buffet. And we're going to have to do this more like pizza delivery, which is what do you need? What can I send to your place of business? What do you are the ingredients that you're going to order? And how can we get the information directly to you at your place of business rather than requiring you to come to us? Yeah, I, I would echo that as well. I'm sorry. I, I would echo that, that as well. I think there's a fundamental shift on how we work, on how work is done. And it was happening even before the pandemic. I think the pandemic may have sped it up. It may have, as Kevin mentioned, removed the walls that thinking outside the box. Well, now there really is no box, literally. Uh, before, we used to think like that. So I think there's an opportunity for us to re imagine what work looks like. And I, and I think we are forced to look at it because we have no other choice. I mean, our university president has uh, challenged us to look at new ways. From an economic perspective, I could understand that, but also from a safety and health perspective as well. If there's not a need to go back in the office, why go back in the office? It's just one fundamental question. Um, the idea of Amazon uh, ordering, uh, getting your, your order in two days, don't be surprised if you get it the same day or before you even think about it, <laughs> you got it. I mean, this is, this is a total shift of how, how we are looking at work. And I've challenged my guys to look at different ways on, on, on conducting activity internally and externally. I'd like to jump in on the other end of that spectrum for farm workers, um, there really is no change. Um, they're continuing, there's still a need to harvest uh, strawberries in the fields and to harvest apples and to grow ferns in, in North Florida. Um, so for farm workers, there really hasn't been much change. Um, the one thing that we're hoping that comes out of this is there, there's a new awareness of farm worker health and safety and that maybe some of the OSHA regulations will be improved to cover farm workers because farm workers really are not covered under OSHA except under the general duty clause. And so, um, you know, uh, there is a trend towards more mechanization, which is also can be good or bad. Um, it just means it would put uh, more farm workers out of work. But farm workers are still, still for a long time, going to still continue to be essential workers. And um, what we need to really think about is how we can take what we've learned from this time and during this pandemic to improve their lives and others like them whose, whose work is, hasn't changed and, if anything, has been more intense and, and, and more dangerous. This is an important time of reflection for all of us, that's for sure. Doc? Yes. Uh, I'm an optimistic person in general, but it is clear globally. It is clear that the this this robotics issue, and I just I know maybe some maybe someone talked about that before a little bit, but robots are cleaning, robots are serving, robots are checking you in, robots are obviously handling all the administrative area. They're folding, stacking, built, pouring you a drink, uh, preparing 200 items at a time. Uh, it, 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 it's a bipolar time of this high tech, high touch in hospitality where kiosks and mobile pre check in is eliminating jobs. End of story. And, and, and we can talk pretty nice about it, but, but it's just it's happening. It's, it's, a, it's a place where hospitality employees are looking into other areas in this downtime and they're testing other industries and finding them more agreeable and are not gonna be going back into the industry. On the other hand, if we wanna look at a positive, a positive is that the owners and developers and large uh, international uh, companies are putting more and more training into cross-training and elevating the quality of the individual that's staying there. But it is absolutely decreasing and it's, it's, it, it really is gonna be a scary time over the next 10 years, it just is. Well, it's certainly a time of transition, and when there's a lot of unknowns, that's when the highest level of anxiety and risk is taken, both in business and just in everybody's personal lives. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left to this session, and I think I'd like to just pose a really quick question to folks. Um, 
and and that really is a selfish question for the rest of our audience. And how can any of you highlight for us um, for us as researchers and occupational health and safety clinicians or practitioners who are often siloed in our research or our clinical practices or focus, how can we better serve our constituents, which are really your constituents? Um, everything from relationships with minority, women-owned businesses, um, it doesn't really matter what the business is, but how can we better, if we're not working with you directly as a partner, how can we as a um, sort of change our approach to better know who our clients are, our stakeholders are in these current times? We have like uh, two minutes left here. And I just offer up, uh, I think it's important that as we just talked about reimagining work, we reimagine stakeholders and partners. Um, and for many of us, we have our traditional partners that we work with in relationships. There are others out there that we may have never tapped into. Uh, I think of Diversity Alliance for Science, for one, uh, that does a lot with companies and pharma companies and others in research. Uh, but there are tons of other resources and partners out there that could help you reimagine work. That's some pretty good imagery. And you have to really sit back and think about that to figure out what that really means. You can think about it from the capacity and tools in your own toolkit, and then shift the focus to be 100% on the stakeholders and figuring out whether you've got the capacity or like Jeannie was mentioning earlier, we, we seek um, collaborations and expand our networks to other resources and experts like yourselves to try to find out the better way to communicate or what information is missing or what ways of connecting those dots do I need for my stakeholders. It may not work for yours, but they will work for mine because it's different. So um, are there any last minute comments that folks would like to make in the last 30 seconds of this session? Bring it on. Uh, I just wanna say uh, you know, thank you, Dr. Kane. I think if anybody has the model uh, to share, it's you. Uh, you know, I know that you have, uh, you know, approached us several years ago to, to work with us and to pursue, uh, you know, some things around safety, improving safety, uh, you know, for our workers. And uh, so, you know, I encourage uh, anybody in this field to, to reach out to industry stakeholders. Don't be afraid to reach out, talk with the leaders uh, of the organizations that, that are uh, you know, working on the front lines and, uh, you know, they're more than happy to learn more about how we can work together to improve health and safety uh, for everybody. So uh, kudos to you and, uh, you know, thank you again for, for having me. It's my pleasure. And I bet you dollars to the donuts that every one of our panelists here would agree with you that they'd be happy to entertain us reaching out. Uh, and most people that actually dedicate themselves to this type of, um, of, of occupation is going to be open to that. That's who we are and that's what we do. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for your contributions to the session and the engagement, your thoughts and, um, and discussion. Um, we're going to take our panel session and trade over to our center director updates. We'll take a quick break from this lunch and learn and we'll be back in about 15 minutes and um, please stick with us. Stay, stay through for all of the sessions and um, we appreciate your time. Be back soon.